Welkom bij de Vrij Links Podcast voor een vrij en onbelemmerd debat. Mijn naam is Lorenzo Girardi. Ik ben filosoof, vrijwilliger bij Vrij Links en vandaag uw host. We gaan het hebben over cartoons. We weten allemaal nog wat er gebeurde rondom de Deense Mohammed cartoons en Charlie Hebdo. In Nederland werd cartoonist Gregorius Nekschot gearresteerd omdat zijn cartoons beledigend zouden zijn. Van Denemarken en Frankrijk tot Nederland, tot Turkije en Iran, cartoonisten lopen al decennia risico bij het werk dat ze doen. Sinds 1999 zette in de VS gebaseerde organisatie Cartoonist Rights zich wereldwijd in voor de rechten van cartoonisten. We spreken vandaag met Terry Anderson, de executive director van Cartoonist Rights. En zelf is hij ook cartoonist. Terry is schots, dus we zullen dit gesprek in het Engels doen. So welcome Terry, you're the executive director of Cartoonist Rights. Could you briefly explain a little bit what your organization does and what your role in that is? Sure. Hi, Lorenzo. Good to be here. Um, Cartoonist Rights Network International, or Cartoonist Rights for short, is a small uh, human rights non-profit based uh, in the state of Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. We are 25 years old uh, at this point. My predecessor, uh, our founder, Dr. Robert Russell, known as Bro, um, to his friends, had a background in uh, international uh, democracy building and peace work in places like Afghanistan, uh, Sri Lanka, Uganda, and so on. And it was during that time uh, in the field that he came to an understanding of the contribution that cartoonists can make towards uh, civil discourse um, and how they are often uh, among the first to feel the effects of any changes to the health of freedom of expression uh, in a given country. So as he came towards the end of his uh, career working abroad and returning to the United States, he wanted to set up a, uh, an NGO that could advocate for those cartoonists and uh, lend assistance where that's required. Uh, as I say, that was 25 years ago now. And um, I've been involved uh, really for a decade or so. I joined the, the board of directors in 2015, which was the year of the Charlotte Hebdo attack, of course, when the world's attention was a uh, focused for a time on cartoonists and, and what they do. Um, and I became uh, executive director in 2019. You mentioned that cartoonists seem to be a bit like the proverbial canary in the coal mine, that when the civil situation starts to deteriorate, they're the first to notice it. And uh, you know, in relation to your own involvement with cartoonist rights, that started, uh, I think, for obvious reasons related to the events you just mentioned. Uh, but was there also anything specific in the 90s that uh, prompted the, the founding of your organization? Or was it more the, the general experience that your founder had across the world? I, w- I would say the latter, probably the the, the general experience. Um, the the nature of the problems and indeed where they are found um, has changed uh, quite significantly, uh, I would say. In, even in my decade of involvement and, and for sure over the 25 years um, since we started, I think Bro probably when he began his work uh, envisaged an organization that would be largely focused on uh, the Middle East and Asia, uh, Africa. Um, since then, for sure there have been problems there and there are some of the the most difficult circumstances for cartoonists can be found there, but equally there have been problems in uh, the Americas, Central and South America for sure. Um, and in the last decade, uh, and again, certainly since um, a couple of very well-known controversies, the Danish uh, Elon's Post and cartoon controversy and then Charlie Hebdo following that, there's been more problems in Europe. Um, and given recent events, perhaps only a matter of time before there are North American cartoonists uh, in situations that have been comparable to to some of the other ones that we've reported on. Um, all, all I would say from my own experience is in this past decade, 
Whereas for very obvious and understandable reasons, everybody's chief anxiety was a uh, was terrorism, extremism, um, and and threats of violence. Uh, some ten years ago, now, um, when we talk to cartoonists, when we ask them what what is them, it's criminalisation. It's the state itself threatening uh, cartoonists, as opposed to any kind of fringe group. You know, working outside of the state, um, and as a consequence of that, um, more often than not, now we find that that many cartoonists are resorting to either voluntary exile or are being forcibly displaced by the circumstances that have befallen them. So we are. And this is hardly exclusive. I'm sure there are many other organisations that would say exactly the same thing. But we are we are finding ourselves now increasingly in the position of being a, a an organisation that's that's in the business of of supporting uh, refugees and and displaced people. So I want to continue that talk about the changing political context, especially given recent events. But maybe first we can just go to the basics a little bit. What is it about cartoons in particular that you think makes certain people, leaders, and so on feel threatened? Uh, one of the most frequently repeated pieces of sarcasm or snark that we get um, is that no dictator was ever brought low by a cartoonist. And that's probably true. Um, my response to that is always then, if that is the case, why do they have such a bloody problem with them? Um, and I think it's less to do with thin skins and and self-aggrandizing and narcissistic though they may be i think it's less to do with in most cases anyway less to do with a, a sense of personal insult and more to do with what the knock-on effect of the cartoon uh, might be uh, i think it's a misconception to suggest that in the case of political and editorial cartooning, that its primary function is humorous. I'm, I'm not convinced that's the case. Humor is often the the, the tone. Uh, humor is often the the um, the chosen mode of communication in in political and editorial cartooning. But equally, there are a lot of cartoonists who who trade in a uh, straightforward protest and consternation. Um, expressions of dissatisfaction um, with the status quo. So from the point of view of the person reading or consuming the cartoon, whatever that may be, in the past, obviously in print, increasingly these days on digital platforms, I think the intention is to uh, get a sense of relief or or catharsis from seeing your feelings encapsulated in somebody else's cartoon. You don't feel alone. You feel less isolated, perhaps less at odds with whatever the prevailing circumstances may be. When you see what you've been feeling, the frustration, the anger, the disgust, the discomfort eh, encapsulated and expressed very succinctly eh, in a cartoon. And that's solidarity an expression of solidarity and a connection. And that, of course, could be conceivably the beginning of something. Um, it's not to say that every cartoonist is calling for revolution, um, but it's impossible to imagine a, a change in society up to and including an overthrow of a government or a, a change of regime happening without solidarity in the first instance. So I think that that ultimately is what the authoritarians fear. It's not it's not that cartoons are singularly dangerous. It's more that they are perhaps part and parcel of something that, that could be dangerous to them. Do you think that's also where the specific nature and the specific need for protecting cartoonists comes from, as opposed to other forms of media or journalism? Because, of course, already before your organization, there were all kinds of organizations that uh, were dedicated to protecting journalistic freedom and journalistic rights. So do you think that this sort of inherent political nature of cartoons and maybe some, some other specific features of cartoons, uh, that that is what necessitates a specific kind of protection? Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. 
you're quite right, and I, I don't I don't mean to suggest that we're the only game in town. Um, there are other cartoonist specific organisations, and beyond that, a lot of the big beasts, if you like, of the of the cartooning of the rather of the freedom of expression and journalistic protection sphere, CPJ, uh, etc., have all at various times done very good work on behalf of cartoonists. I don't mean to suggest otherwise. I think. From their perspective, however, from the from the perspective of the cartoonists, it it sets their mind at ease, I guess, in a way, to know that there is a organisation run specifically for them, and perhaps even more importantly, by them. I'm a cartoonist; that is my background. Uh, likewise, the president of our board and several other members of our board of directors. Um. Cartooning is neither fish nor fowl. So while it perhaps again in the past has been consumed, uh, whatever news is consumed, and therefore has a very strong association with journalism, and I know that many cartoonists would categorize themselves as journalists, there are just as many who would not and would categorize themselves as artists first. Um, and indeed, as the old models of how a uh, cartooning functions as a profession unravel. Um, they are finding themselves increasingly in terms of their day-to-day -day life, having far more in common with the way uh, other visual artists conduct their discipline. If a cartoonist these days, particularly ones that don't work with a news organization, uh, are going to make any money at all, They'll be doing that through things like exhibitions, events, um, self-published books of their work, um, other crowdfunding options, things like Patreon and so on. And that places them far more in the camp of of a of visual arts practice and uh, going forward than it than it necessarily would traditional journalism. And then beyond that, there is another growing category um, that that are probably first and foremost best described as activists. Um, they are people that are using cartooning not to make a living at all. That's not the point of it, and that's that's not why they're in the game. They are using cartooning as a medium to get their, their message across. And I think that uh, in the future, for sure, um, in the next 25 years, if we're talking about cartoonists at all, those are the people that we will be discussing and, and, and defending. It will be people that have simply used the cartoon to communicate and that has got them in trouble. And it will not necessarily be somebody who makes cartoons for a living. So for all those reasons, the 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 fact that the the the, the a cartoon itself is often as much a written thing as it is a drawn thing. Um the fact that it doesn't necessarily fit one hundred percent in any of these silos, journalism, art, activism, it crosses all these um, categories and, and definitions. If they come to us in the first instance, they don't have to explain themselves. <laughs> they don't have to unpack what they're doing. They don't have to feel in any way apologetic or that they have to define terms. Um, as far as we're concerned, if you got in trouble because you drew a cartoon, you can talk to us. You've hinted a little bit at the precarious nature of being a cartoonist and doing it for a living, and maybe that's sort of slowly going away in general. Do you think that that's a reason why cartoonists are uh, perhaps an easy target for oppression from certain sides? They're certainly more vulnerable than ever, uh, precisely because, as I say, they are uh, increasingly now self-starters, freelancers, um, self-employed people. Uh, not with a salaried position, uh, not physically in a newsroom, um, working outside of a even a regular relationship with an editor, or beyond that, a, a, a large organisation or a or, or a corporation that in the past would have at least shared, if you like, uh, some of the responsibility, if not liability in terms of publishing the work. So now where you're talking about people who are more often than not just posting to social media, 
in, in the same way that we all do. They just so happen to be posting cartoons. Um, if if they're if they're going to get in trouble, then uh, they're not necessarily going to have that network of support uh, that a, a cartoonist, a typical press cartoonist of of 30, 40 years ago would have had. Could you maybe give us a few examples of the kind of trouble that, as you put it, cartoonists get into? Uh, and of course, it's going to be very different for different parts of the world, but just so we get an idea and also get an idea of the, the variety of things that they face. Of course. Okay. So I will immediately contradict myself and describe a cartoonist who does have a relationship with a news platform. But he's one of the he's one of the few remaining. Um, Ashraf Omar in uh, in Egypt works with uh, an independent news platform called Al Manasa, and earlier in the year uh, he published a series of cartoons there with them, which were essentially very typical editorial cartoons talking about economic uh, circumstances in Egypt. Uh, as well as um, uh, power outages and problems with uh, infrastructure in the country. Um, in in July, uh, uh, officers, uh, although at that time they weren't identified as such, they were playing close personnel, came to his home, uh, took him away. There was a period where his whereabouts were unknown and the police denied any knowledge of, of what had happened to him. It eventually became apparent that he had been arrested um, his wife and his uh, defence lawyer alleged that during the initial questioning, uh, he was threatened with uh, electrocution, questioned about his cartoons, and ultimately accused uh, of being a supporter of terrorism within Egypt. And ever since then, he's been in a period of pre-trial detention, which uh, every 15 days or so is extended. Uh, just this week, as we are speaking, it has happened. It happened for the eighth consecutive time, and these extensions occur over uh, exactly the same medium we are speaking to right now. They're video conferences. Um, it's not a proper hearing. It's a measure that was brought in during the pandemic when people couldn't obviously physically get together in a, in a court setting, uh, supposedly a temporary measure, and it's been kept ever since. Um, so there's no opportunity for conference between a client and defence attorney. Um, it's very quick, brief. Uh, the, you know, the, the name and, and identifying number of, of the of the cases heard, and another fifteen days are added on to this seemingly indefinite period of, of pre-trial detention, which uh, is obviously highly distressing. His family's wife gets to see him for thirty minutes out of every thirty days. So um, we're desperately worried about him. Uh, likewise, uh, Atina Farghadani in Iran, um, a cartoonist who we've known about and advocated for for over a decade now. She was she was the primary case when I joined the organisation. Um, but earlier this year, her work was to be shown as part of the Oslo Freedom Forum, and uh, inevitably she was invited to attend. She went to make inquiries about the relevant paperwork that would be necessary uh, in order to do that and was told by officials that she was free to do so, but on the understanding that she would be arrested immediately upon her return. Um, in protest at that, uh, Atena put some of her artwork literally on the wall. Uh, she, she tried to put a poster up uh, in Pasteur Street near the, the main government buildings in Tehran uh, and was almost immediately uh, uh, picked up by police officers. Like Ashraf, uh, Athena seems to have been quite roughly treated. Um, there, there was a description of a, of a headwind that was incurred while she was uh, being detained. Um, and in the past, certainly, uh, because this is our third time in custody in, in, the, in the time that I've known her. In the past, Atena has, again, been very poorly treated. Uh, last year, there was uh, allegations of an attempted force feeding of a substance that she didn't recognise. She alleges that that was poison. We don't know. Uh, and before that, when she was first in prison, uh, uh, as I say, a, a decade ago now, uh, at that time, um, she was subjected to 
pregnancy and virginity tests, which the UN classifies as a form of torture. She's uh, resorted to hunger strike as well in the past, and that's inevitably affected her health. Um, she's had a heart attack uh, before while a prisoner, so again, her, her health and welfare is our, our chief concern uh, at the moment. I don't think there's any question of her not uh, being found guilty and, 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 and incurring criminal uh, charges for what she did. Uh, that's just the way Iran is. But uh, right now, it's her it's her health, her health and well being that's that's of top concern to us. Um, the last one I would mention, uh, that's an ongoing case for us, is in Turkey. Uh, Zera Omeriglu there is a contributor to uh, the Le Mans Humor magazine. Um, probably best described as, as Turkey's Charlie Hebdo. A, a regular, well-known, squarely adult humour publication. And at the start of the pandemic, when everything was still very fluid and we didn't know exactly what was happening in terms of symptoms and measures and everything else, uh, Zera had a cartoon published there, um, which is probably, if we can, best linked to. Um, but in terms of a visual description, if you imagine a couple engaged in an intimate act and uh, the uh, male in the couple is talking to himself and is relieved to find that he has not l lost his sense of taste or smell. Uh, because at that time, uh, that was one of the symptoms that everyone was being advised to watch out for in terms of a, a COVID infection. It's a body, adult cartoon about sex, but it's certainly not what you would describe as in any way intended to titillate. It's not erotic. It's not pornographic by any stretch of the imagination. Um, nevertheless, uh, she has been uh, charged with obscenity and described by the panel of experts uh, that adjudicate on these matters as being actually uh, dangerous to children. Um, which is absurd, given the context where the cartoon was published. And in our opinion, uh, a, a criminal prosecution that's based entirely on our gender. I don't think a man making the same joke in the same context, in the same publication with the same cartoon, would have faced any question of criminal prosecution on it. So because she is an outspoken woman uh, in Erdogan's Turkey. I believe that is why she's being prosecuted in this way. A case that's gone on uh, since, since 2022 now, um, delayed countless times for a lot of very tenuous reasons, up to including on one occasion, the judge simply not turning up on a day when <laughs> business was supposed to be conducted. Um, and that's a pattern that we often see. Um, cases like this often don't coalesce, um, don't come to uh, a decision um, because the waiting is the punishment. The psychological effect, the expense, the inability to plan, the constant having to think first and foremost about what stage the case is at. These are these are the way that the the freedom of expression of the cartoonist is is repressed, um, rather than bring it to some kind of swift conclusion. The danger of that being, of course, that the cartoon cartoonist could could be acquitted, the thing could come to an end, and and uh, and there could be no censure at all. So this kind of grinding legal process is something that we're seeing increasingly. Do you think that's also done with the explicit intent to send a signal to others? To send a signal, don't criticize the regime, don't criticize a certain religion, don't criticize whatever is helping the ones in power stay in power in this specific case. Uh, so that's done just to set an example. It, it can vary, but more often than not, the answer is yes. It's certainly a... Ashraf's case in Egypt, that's how it's being interpreted there uh, by the uh, relevant unions 
um, you, journalist union and associations uh, in Egypt have all commented that, as far as they're concerned, that he's an example is being made of him, and that, that every other Egyptian cartoonist is is being invited, if you like, to take note uh, of what has happened to him. Um, in Turkey, we've seen again not not just cartoonists by any stretch of the imagination, other journalists academics, public figures, etc., they get prosecuted there on an almost industrial scale. Um, in the past, a lot of that has been wherever a cartoonist has been very specifically criticising President Erdogan. That seems to be the most the thing most likely to result in uh, procedures like this going ahead, but it's, it's not exclusive. Uh, and as I say, in Zera's case, I also think if you look, you can see a pattern. Again, other women uh, in, in entertainment and public life, poets, uh, pop stars, actresses, and so on, um, very readily get accused of obscenity uh, or corrupting behaviour uh, in Turkey now, uh, in a way that indicates a, 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 a advancing patriarchal attitude. So maybe we can then turn back a little bit to where we started, namely the changing political landscape uh, here in the West as well, because you know it shouldn't be a surprise to people that Egypt, Iran, Turkey, those are, to say the least, fairly authoritarian countries. But we've also seen a shift in the West, in the US recently with the re-election of Trump, but also in the Netherlands with uh, the electoral victory of uh, Geert Wilders. Uh, so we've seen this shift towards populism, nationalism, authoritarianism. Um, at the same time, the past years, over the past decade or so, we've seen a group of people very concerned that it's a more leftist, progressive politics that has been smothering free speech, as it were. How, how do you see these changes in the West, where there's maybe less of a direct political oppression? Uh, how, how do you see these changes and this context affect the work of cartoonists over here? I know that many European cartoonists uh, are still... Um, unpacking, struggling with uh, a lot of the issues that were raised um, from Charlie Hebdo onward um, is drawing a cartoon about Muslims punching up or punching down. You know, on the one hand, undoubtedly, Muslim people are, in most European countries, a, a minority, um, depending on what country we're talking about, a, a marginalised or demonised minority. Um, but by the same token, Islam itself is a faith and organised faiths exert authority on their adherents. Therefore, they represent power. Therefore, religion is a legitimate target for, for criticism and satire. So these are still things that, that are open questions and, and uh, aren't necessarily readily resolved. One thing I do think we, we need to do a better job uh, with in terms of the cartoonists uh, in the West is is diversify our own ranks. Um, a typical cartoonist convention um, is a gathering of men of a certain age and a certain colour. Um, so uh, if if there were more if there was more diversity, you know, within the within the grouping itself, then that would. Uh, leads to a greater diversity of portrayals within within the material itself. Um, <clears throat> but equally, you know, positively, I would say our leaders are becoming more diverse. There are there are more minorities represented in politics. There are more women, for sure, in, in, in politics. Um, where I'm speaking to you from in, in the United Kingdom, the, the main opposition party here just elected its first female black leader. Cartoonists here should not fee, be afraid to caricature that lady just because of her ethnicity, any more so than they were afraid to caricature the previous Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, because of his. Um, and so we can't allow ourselves to be tripped up by um, notions of, of propriety or political correctness or whatever the formulation of the day might be. Um, because it is really just the same concern. The same concerns roll around perennially. I am old enough to remember uh, conversations about political correctness before we ever had conversations about woke 
Um, so it, it it doesn't. I don't think it does it does us any harm to examine our own biases and our own um, preconceptions. Um, on the other side of the fence, it's equally quite apparent that freedom of speech specifically has become a hobby horse for the right in politics. Um, and in my view, most of the time, that's quite disingenuous. Um, I think it's very obvious that when the right talk about freedom of speech, they mean their freedom of speech and nobody else's. Uh, and um, just in the past month or so since you and I um, had our first conversation, of course, um, Geert Wilders um, took umbrage at a, a Tear Dry Arts cartoon in Trow and encouraged all of his supporters to go and cancel their subscriptions. So this from someone who presumably in the past would have had uh, criticisms to make um, of leaders in other countries where car cartoons are suppressed. Um, now, in in very in a very unvarnished way, um, sicking his uh, adherents and his devotees onto a cartoonist that displeased him. Um, so I think the challenge for us uh, is now largely to do with authoritarianism or the trend towards authoritarianism that arises from populism um, and nationalism uh, as well. Um, in, in terms of what's just happened in the United States, and of course we are an American uh, NGO, so what happens in the States does have a, a direct effect on us. During the first Trump presidency, I think cartoonists, as it transpired, had relatively little in the way of problems, simply because uh, Trump doesn't read and therefore isn't really aware of cartoons. Um, he's very obviously and very aware of what is said about him on television and had a lot to say about what comedians were saying about him on TV. Uh, but he didn't really ever at any point acknowledge any other kind of form of a sat satirical comment or a comedy to, to my recollection. So second time around, we can probably assume that his diet his media diet probably hasn't changed that much. Um, but what is different this time is a far more stated, explicit um, a attitude towards his quote-unquote enemies, um, personal and figurative. Uh, he keeps talking about the enemy within. He keeps talking about forces within the United States that are running counter to his agenda. And at the moment, uh, as we are speaking, literally, today, Congress uh, are giving consideration to legislation that would give the presidency uh, sweeping powers to revoke the non-profit status of any uh, organisation in the United States deemed to have supported terrorism. Now, that comes from uh, what's happened in Gaza, and it's a it's a fairly pointed uh, threat to anybody in the United States now who is campaigning for Palestinian uh, rights. Um, but definitions change over time, and who is or is not a terrorist is often dependent upon international alliances and strategic goals. And I think probably if they wanted to, they could go through the history of almost any human rights campaigner and find them on the side of a subjectively a categorized terrorist. The most obvious example, notorious example, of course, being somebody like Nelson Mandela. 
again, I'm old enough to remember when Nelson Nelson Mandela was reported and, and portrayed in Western media as a terrorist. So that's a real threat, not just to freedom of expression, but to to the ability of organizations like ours to, to, to function. I just want to comment a little bit on what you said earlier, uh, what you sort of ended with, uh, the different perspectives on what is or, or isn't uh, punching up or punching down in the case of Islam or Muslims. It's also, you know, in this case, in a very different context, you mentioned uh, what is or isn't counted as a terrorist, uh, which is a similar issue, but from a very different context. So we don't just have to deal with a changing political climate. Uh, you already hinted a little bit at a changing digital landscape, which affects the audience that a cartoonist can reach, and there's also the different perspectives involved. Uh, I know that played a big role in the Danish Mohammed cartoons. So they were originally intended for a very specific audience, and um, that went global all over the world without any context, and we've seen the results of that. So do you think that this increasingly globalized world has made the work of cartoonists more difficult and has led to a, to a more dangerous situation for them? Yes, uh, and ad both inadvertently and in some cases deliberately. You know, part of the reason that the Danish um, situation escalated to such an extent was because the original twelve uh, cartoons were then uh, put into a, a dossier along with several other unrelated and and, and arguably even more insulting cartoons and that, that in turn was then circulated by bad actors um, uh, with the deliberate intent of uh, stirring up um, backlash. Um, but social media, of course, is is, is uncontrollable in, in a lot of ways. So somebody posting a cartoon in one country can't really um, prevent somebody in another part of the world seeing it and misinterpreting it not without either you know trying to take measures to to contextualize it but the, in so doing running the risk of ruining their satirical observation because you know nothing diffuses a joke faster than saying this is a joke um or um invalidating their sarcasm. Um, the whole point of irony is that you are stating something that is not the case with a straight face. And that's really subjective and really difficult to, to legislate for. Um, it's not helped now by the fact that because so much of what happens online by dint of the sheer volume, uh, there probably is no other way to deal with it than by some measure of automation. Because so much content moderation now is automated, what we are increasingly finding is if somebody is, in, or is on, let's say, Facebook and wants to make a cartoon that is anti-fascist, that wants to make a statement that is against racism, that is against white supremacy or the KKK. But in order to make that statement, they have to portray the thing. That cartoon gets flagged as hate speech because it has a swastika in it, because it has a white hood in it, because it has some other some other kind of symbology or or reference in it that's that's readily uh, picked up by the by the automated processes. So the cartoonist is then left destroyed because it's the precise opposite of the intention. Uh, and sometimes you can appeal and sometimes you can have content reinstated. Sometimes you can't. Um, that's at least a, a malfunction of a well-meaning, well-intended system. But there are also people who will deliberately and maliciously false flag cartoonists or their content um, and that's often on the basis of party political allegiances um, knowing that 99 times out of 100 a complaint to a platform like Facebook will, will be upheld at least in the first instance 
So if if you want to make trouble or if you want to disrupt a cartoonist's uh, feed, that's very easily done. Um, just pick a cartoon and and flag it as problematic for for whatever reason. Um, and uh, that that is normally uh, again, as I say, at least in the first instance, uh, effective. Um, and beyond that, then on um, a platform like Twitter, um, for sure, knowing as we do, again, that so much of Twitter's traffic is not created by human beings, certain cartoonists have found themselves at the centre of what on their end appears to be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people complaining about their cartoon. The truth probably is that it's dozens of people, but those people are in control of many, many hundreds, if not thousands of bots and other salt puppet accounts. Um, difficult to prove whether these things are are unofficial or or, or actually state sanctioned. Um, I suspect in some cases if not all, but certainly in some cases it's, it, it, it does have a, a degree of, of, of state uh, involvement. Um, the biggest example that I always like to cite for people is the Chinese dissident uh, Bad Yu Chiao. Now, he now lives in Australia. Very talented, multi-disciplined visual artist and, and cartoonist. Search for him on Twitter X and you will be astonished by the legions of impersonators uh, that he, he has to try and differentiate himself from. Um, organized and structured in such a way that, it, 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 in my opinion, can, can only be um, something that's uh, got CCP in, involvement. Um, and again, designed ultimately to keep eyeballs off of him to disrupt uh, and uh, perhaps ultimately discredit him, um, but certainly to to make it harder for people to, to see his work. So I, I was going to ask whether you see this changing political climate, the shift towards authoritarianism as the bigger threat or whether it's more this sort of new digital media scenario. Uh, but maybe the the better question is: Is the real threat this insidious combination, where you have you know the CCP or Russia making use of troll farms, or you know now you see the, in the US these tech giants cozying up with Trump? Uh, do, do you think that maybe the real threat is is there to put it like that? The the threat to the the threat to the medium is digital. Um. If you are an editorial or political cartoonist, then your content, like all political content, is increasingly going to disappear from many of these platforms. We know that Meta has a problem with news. Full stop. That's only getting worse. That's starting to then likewise affect um, commentary content that talks about news and part of commentary of course is satire we know anecdotally um, that people feel as if their ability to reach people via, via twitter x has has you know significantly degraded in the past uh, 12 months a lot of that is algorithmic um it's quite clear i would suggest um, in the run up to the election, um, that that platform is now being used essentially as just an amplifier for its owner's political views. So if if you're saying anything, not necessarily aimed directly at him, but if you're saying anything that's contrary to those uh, agenda points, uh, then your work probably isn't going to be seen. All the platforms have moved away from static images towards video in terms of content performance. That's not great for cartoonists because most of them uh, don't want to be on camera. 
um, cartoonists, I always say, are, are, are actors and entertainers that are too shy to get on stage. So they want to put their work forward. They don't necessarily want to put themselves forward. Um, and then last on the list, and getting bigger all the time, is the AI problem. And to what extent, uh, as unsatisfactory as these platforms are for all the reasons I described, but what possible visibility uh, there's going to be when it gets to the stage where all content is subsumed by the staggering quantities of material that will get put out um, via the the use of AI. And that will just be a numbers game. We'll, we'll simply be completely outnumbered um, by all that stuff. So I'm of the opinion increasingly that the, 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 the social media platforms as they have been used thus far uh, are going to go away quite quickly. It, it just won't be worth a candle anymore. Um, I don't know if that necessarily means a return to print. It's hard to see how that would work economically. Um, I, I think, again, the cartoonists are, uh, are going to have to get quite smart and 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 diversify their skill sets and and figure out where else this work can be seen and have the what i described before have the the, the, the kind of more visual arts approach to their practice happenings gatherings exhibitions um something that has a i feel like an in real life element to it that can't be readily duplicated uh, on an online uh, platform um, we'll always have clients as I say because even if it, even if it becomes literally impossible to do this as a job there's still going to be someone at a protest somewhere holding up a cartoon placard that they drew themselves and if that person gets arrested that's our client so you, you sketch a pretty bleak situation of the future. Um, what can we, as, as I say, the public, do to help cartoonists? Aside from support your organization, of course, we'll get to that in a moment. But what can we do to improve the situation? So uh, when you find, as I say, online or, or elsewhere, when you, when you find a cartoonist who's, whose work you appreciate, generally speaking, they will have another way um, uh, of of you being able to support them directly, whether it's Patreon, Substack, that's becoming increasingly popular now. Um, this kind of subscription model for content, um, coffee, any of these virtual tip jar services that you have. Perhaps they sell merchandise through their website. People are people are often kind of skeptical about that, but in the same way that when you go and see a band live these days. <laughs> It's the merchandise table where they're actually sustaining themselves. The same is true of the cartoonists. So any of those things um, are 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 uh, appreciated. If you have a news platform that you're particularly fond of, um, and they don't have cartoons, maybe write in and ask them why. A lot of the time it'll be economic. They'll, they'll argue the case that they simply can't uh, afford a cartoonist. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that uh, economics have often become the fig leaf, the kind of easy excuse. 2008, economic crash. Lots of contributors let go back then. That excuse flew. But now not so much because I think the economics eh, are all based upon engagement. It's all based upon views. It's all based upon clicks, etc., etc. And there are few things that can garner engagement better than a cartoon. Um, so. It could be that 
they need to rethink their definitions uh, a little. I always say that as long as we call ourselves cartoonists, the word cartoon, uh, unfortunately, carries with it a, a, a lot of baggage. Cartoon sounds flippant, childish, and therefore disposable. Um, but a visual meme consultant, they sound indispensable. Every news platform should have a visual meme consultant. So if we just changed our uh, professional profile a little, perhaps we'd make more headway. But letters to the editor or the equivalent, you know, feedback through social media, you know, whatever you're consuming news, ask the people in charge why they're not, why you're not seeing cartoons. Then that at least it puts that in their in their mindset, you know, when they're in a position to make decisions about the content that they put forward. Um, and uh, you know, beyond that, just be be conscious of these trends that that that, that we're talking about. Uh, you know, again, that sounds glib. I know I'm talking to probably a pretty politically engaged uh, listenership with this podcast, but um, but you know, where and when you can, without risking your own safety, of course, but where and when you can challenge these authoritarian, uh, patriarchal, uh, and repressive attitudes. And then finally, uh, should we want to support your organization, Cartoonist Rights, more directly? How how would we go about doing that? So as I mentioned, we are a non-profit. Um, we accept donations at any given time. But in the month of December, we always have a pledge drive. So if you're listening to this towards the end of the year, and especially after Giving Tuesday, which is the 3rd of December, and go to our website, cartoonistrights.org slash donate you'll find details there of how to support us with any luck eh, we should be able to offer some nice eh, incentives as well you might be able to get some eh, some cartoon artwork or some other gift eh, in appreciation of your support um, in the United States if anyone's listening eh, it also means that your, your donation is eh, tax deductible um, before the end of the, the 2024 year. So thank you, Terry, for taking the time to talk to us and for the work you do with Cartoonist Rights, of course. Thank you, Lorenz. Dit was het alweer voor deze aflevering van de Vrijlinks podcast. Wil je meer Vrijlinks? Luister dan naar Achter de Ophef, de podcast waarbij we ophef ontleden, kijken wat de argumenten waren en kijken of het de ophef eigenlijk wel waard was. Houd www.vrij-links.nl in de gaten voor nieuwe artikelen en projecten. Abonneer je op onze nieuwsbrief en laat een donatie achter, want wij kunnen dit niet zonder jullie steunen.